I'm saying that the suffering you're experiencing is connected to my oppression. And there's no such thing as liberation for you without liberation for me. But maybe it, if it was in a different situation and we have the power, maybe you would call it. My name is Rudy Rockman and I'm a Jewish and Israel rights activist living in Israel. My name is Amir, I'm from Bethlehem and I'm an activist for the Palestinian rights. My name is Yudaha Kohen, I live in Judea or the West Bank and I'm a teacher and peace activist. My name is Malcolm. I'm from Jerusalem and I'm a peace activist. I'm a Palestinian Armenian. My name is David. I live in the Holy Land and I am an explorer. My name is Loi. I am uh, from Bethlehem and I'm a salesman in a souvenir shop. Please come and have a seat if you agree with the following statement. The liberations of Israelis and Palestinians are not mutually exclusive. When we think about Palestinian rights and liberations, and we think about Jewish rights and Jewish liberations, that oftentimes we're told by the world that one has to come at the cost of the other. But in reality, I think if we break down what Palestinians truly need and what Israelis truly need, they don't contradict. Yeah. I think to get to that awareness, it's really important for us to really unpack the grievances and aspirations that exist on both sides. The way I would relate to it is, I think we have separate narratives, and when I say narratives, I don't mean one is true and one is not true, I mean that we've understood the last hundred years very differently. And the, when I say narrative, I mean a series of facts, like a collection of facts that are selectively chosen and contextualized within an ideological worldview. And both of our stories have different facts, the, but the facts cannot be true, we're just taking the facts that we want and organizing those facts in a way that tell a story and that makes sense to us. And I think for the last hundred years what we've been doing is telling the truth about ourselves but getting it wrong about each other. And it's almost like I don't know you, in, in my story you're just the antagonist and I'm creating an identity for you in my story and you're creating an identity for me in your story that have very little to do with how we're really experiencing ourselves. So I think the first step to being able to get past um, us feeling like our liberations are mutually exclusive is being willing to engage the identity and story of the other without feeling our own stories or identities threatened. I think that we can live together whenever we forget about our pride. Mm -hmm. Whenever I think about Palestine and Israel, I remember the past. When we had fights and all of wars, if we forget about this and forget about the pride, and just think about you like you are human, just like me. We are the same. But you are from a different culture and from a different culture. We will live together in the same country and it will be amazing. Remind me for this intense example. If a woman is raped and she's gone to court to ask for justice for, for against the rapist. Now, if during this tragic, traumatic experience she's going through, if she, is, if she found anything that's sharp, any knife, anything. And she tried to finally defend herself. And maybe she finally felt the power to cut his head off, his hands off, his legs off, to make him like into this non-human shape. And if she goes to court and there is evidence that he was raping her, people would laugh at the judge if he tells, oh, how savage are you? You're doing this to the man. Okay? So the suffering of the rapist, because she is the one who is attacked first, is very different. It's not measured equally whatsoever, with the rape, sorry, from the rapist. Because the raped is the victim. When we're speaking about an oppressor with power, who can end the suffering of both, just like that, we cannot equate it with the suffering. So I want to answer back, because on the premise of what you said, I agree with you that if we look at the power structure today that exists and we try to compare which one is more powerful, there's no doubt, I think we all agree in this room, that Israel has the power. That means we have also the responsibility to change the situation. There's also another element that Palestinians are also suffering under the PA and Hamas that isn't even part of this conversation. 
But the way that the Zionist perspective and the Jewish perspective, Jewish liberation perspective experiences it, that in 1948, we didn't all come. There were many Jews that were living here still. And Jews came not only from Europe. Yeah. The, the, the places that we last lived in were our experience in our diaspora before we returned home. However, in 1948, when we created a state, the war begins because we create a state. And not all the Arabs, not all the Palestinians are against it, but the leadership are against it. We're faced in a war, and the consequences of those wars in 1948, in 67, and in 73 have resulted in the creation of the status quo. So it's not because Israel came and said, we need to kill or we need to displace, but it's because there was a war. So what I have to say to you is that I think when we look at suffering, we have to understand the greater context. Now you use the example of rape. For our perspective, we see ourselves as that woman that is walking down the street, and all of a sudden we're being attacked. We're being at war and from all the surrounding Arab nations. And remember that at that time, Israel wasn't strong like it is today. It, was, it didn't know if it'd have a next day to live. So it's attacked by all the surrounding Arab countries. It defends itself, does things that are right and not right along the way. People suffer from it on both sides. And then the consequences of that suffering is always pinned on Israel. And I think there has to be an understanding that there is a greater context, that Israel didn't come out of the blue. Jews didn't come out, out of nowhere and say, we need to cause that suffering. There was a context that existed that forces both of us to fight. And I actually think that that fight did not stem from Arabs and Jews, because historically we're cousins and we come from the same lands, we come from the same culture, we have very similar language, Salam Aleikum, Shalom Aleichem, Khamsa Khamesh, we're very similar people. I think outside forces wanted us to fight each other, to be in conflict in, with each other, and still profit till this day from that suffering. We need to realize we have different perspectives of history, and, and that's where uh, it's not really defense to us, and it was uh, Theodor Herzl and the founders of, they were very, very proud to say this is a colonial settler movement. They were not hiding it, because they were supported by the European powers, mainly the British, and they were promised. And it was totally, to us, in our eyes, totally biased towards European colony. Now this is sometimes something I hear very often from Palestinian activists, but the explanation to that is that the vocabulary that these individuals had was a vocabulary that existed in the midst of colonizers. And when they were using this word, they didn't mean foreign empire coming, taking the land of a people and exporting the resources outside. They meant the development of the land. So the I think the, the tools to go and develop the land to revive it. But each one of them didn't connect to the mindset of a colonizer of this is not our land, but we're still going to take it and force the people to be oppressed. They really, from the bottom of our hearts, felt this is the only land, not that we can be safe in, because we could have gone other places, right? Angola, Biobijan, Madagascar, Uganda were places that were offered, but the Jews said no. It was the place that we can go back to our ancestral homeland of where we belong. And so although they use certain terms that I reject those terms, I would never consider what we should do as a colonial project, but they use those terms because they only saw the world through that premise. Because and they, they were colonized. Yeah, because they were mentally colonized, right? They, they wouldn't, they didn't, most of them didn't speak Hebrew, right? That's our language. Our tongue was colonized. Our minds were colonized, not only physically, but also emotionally, mentally, and even sometimes spiritually. And so right now we're going through a process of decolonizing, which is why someone like me looks back at that type of literature. I understand the premise and I connect to it, but I completely reject that idea. And I also reject a lot of ways that things did happen in practice, that certain individuals, whether well, even the government did. So for example, I'm completely against the British parliamentary system that exists today. It's not a system that works for Middle Easterners. It's not a system that works for Jews or for Arabs. We need to have a conversation of what kind of government we can create here that not only works for Jews, but also others that live in this land and have a conversation of what is important that the Palestinians need and what is important that the Israelis need. And I think the bottom line is that they don't contradict. The truth is like, we have a story that I feel that in order for us to have this conversation, I need to share that our, the oppression we, in our heads, are still suffering from is one that goes back thousands of years. And when we come back to ourselves, when we come back to our land, when we experience the, the material liberation that we experienced, having an independent state again, coming back to Jerusalem, still didn't help us uh, liberate ourselves psychologically or decolonize our identity. And I think that right now, a lot of the, when I've had these conversations in the past, the conclusion I came to is that a lot of the material 
um, expressions and manifestations of oppression that Palestinians have, have expressed to me and complained about to me are actually expressions of a Jewish identity crisis. Meaning in 1967, we came back to the West Bank, to Judea and Samaria, to what we consider the cradle of Jewish civilization. But we didn't know what we were doing here. Um, we've been dreaming about these lands for thousands of years. We've been talking about coming back to Bethlehem and coming back to Hebron and coming back to Shiloh and Jerusalem on the one hand. But on the other hand, the Americans and Europeans don't want us here. But on the other hand, we need the mountains overlooking our densest population center to protect ourselves. But on the other hand, there are all these Palestinians here. What are we going to do? Are we going to make them citizens? Are we not going to make them citizens? Are we going to say we're leaving soon? So for the last 50-something years, we've been doing everything and nothing and maybe pretending one thing and not... So in many ways, I acknowledge Palestinians are victims of a Jewish identity crisis, but part of our oppression is the identity crisis. And if we, if the Jewish people can liberate ourselves from that identity crisis, I think that would have an impact on how Palestinians are experiencing Israel and it would definitely eliminate most, if not all, of the material expressions of oppression that you're experiencing. We have to always think long term and not think about the past. So we have to compromise the past and think about building a better future for us and yourselves because both sides have lost something valuable to them. So we have to compromise this idea, this thought that's sitting in our mind. And we can't always keep thinking about it saying, oh, well, my great granddad was a refugee or, you know, whatever, my cousin died in whatever battle. Like we, we have to forget this. We have to compromise and we have to look for a better future, because if we don't do that, then there is going to be no future. You know, I'm not saying risking your identity or forgetting who you are or where you come from or what your roots are, but we have to forget the things that we lost or the things that hurt us. That way we can move towards a better future. Yeah. Like maybe Lua is saying, we need to let go of materialistic stuff, such as land, house, whatever was taken, for example, from us Palestinians in particular, or for the Jewish people, maybe this, when they were here 2,000 years ago, it's, it's their land, etc. And so they want, they want the land back. But um, I think what we need back is identity. What we need back is dignity. What we need now is internal value. I think the question of liberation for Palestinians and Israelis um, needs to be treated very much individually. On the uh, Israeli side, um, first of all, so there's a movement called Zionism, which in its broadest definition means the belief that uh, the Jewish nation has the right to return to its ancestral homeland and to express political sovereignty there, in some borders. Um, in concept, that is a just theory, it is a liberation movement, and it's been f uh, in practice on one level phenomenally successful from the narrow point of view of its own interests. It's provided uh, state-of-the-art, powerful military, a booming economy, day-to-day, uh, -day, yes there's problems and major security challenges, but day-to-day -day security for its citizens a refuge for Jews from around the world to escape to and have the right to live in. So, in its concept it's just, and its practice, in terms of its interests, it's been phenomenally successful. However, there is an irony. If Zionism is about self-determination, in as much as identity is a function of creating the boundary, the relationship between where I, as an individual or community, end, and the rest of the world begin, our identity is still being defined by the fact of a quote-unquote enemy population who live next to us. And so we come back to create our own future, to express our pure identity, to have uh, our own control over our destiny, and de facto are defined in our identity by how we respond to a challenge in our environment. And until that gets resolved, Israelis don't have full liberation. They have a fa fake, mirage liberation, where they think they're expressing their identity, but are in fact defined by the Palestinian people. If Israel, which has the power and therefore I feel like the responsibility to initiate liberations for both people, uh, is willing to take responsibility for that question, responsibility for that question, how do we express our dream in this land while actually expressing our identity without being defined by the other? and allowing the people who are already were living here, whether we like it or not, to be liberated. Until that happens, Israel is not actually experiencing the liberation that it's designed to provide 
for the Jewish people. I think Zionism is one of many Jewish liberation movements. We talk about it a lot because it succeeded where others failed. But it really needs to be understood. When we tell our story, Zionism didn't start out of the blue. From the time that the Romans displaced us from this land until Zionism, there were at least 12 or 13 Jewish liberation movements that tried to restore Jewish independence to this land. They failed over and over again. They failed. The one that succeeded was Zionism. So we speak about it and many people call themselves Zionists still to attach themselves to that success. But the reality is it was one of many liberation movements and it succeeded, but it finished. And today, if we want to move forward, and if we want to move forward together, we have to acknowledge that it finished, and whatever we create in its wake has to be able to protect Zionism's positive achievements while correcting its flaws and actually answering the questions that Zionism does not have the intellectual tools to address. I personally know someone who was killed by this conflict. So I've had uh, four friends in uh, the last operation in Gaza that were killed. I have my officer who also wasn't killed but received a bullet through his throat and today can no longer speak because of it. And a lot of people who have experienced suffering from the Israeli side, not everyone, but a lot of them, see their suffering as blame on the other side and we have to demonize the other side because all of our suffering comes from there. The way I've experienced it and been able to deal with it is this suffering is not caused by the people but is caused by the conflict and I have to be able to separate the two because the only way to change the conflict is to one day come together with those people and change the reality because suffering is experienced on both sides. Okay, so I have three friends from the same family of me. I'm from family Hamamra. They are from the same family and they were killed, the three of them, in 2014 by Israeli. And it's not something personally. In the same time, I know another girl named Q and she had an uh, American friend visitor coming to Israel and there, there was two Palestinian guys saw them and they tried to kill them and they killed the American citizen that is coming here to meet her friend Kira. So I think that Palestinians hurt Israelians and Israelians hurt Palestinians and we killed each other enough. So let's just forget about it and start a new life just because I'm, I care about the future more than I care about the past. But you want to make the future not like the past. Yeah, exactly. So you, you have to know about the past. I think the only thing I would add to what you guys are saying is that it's not enough just to acknowledge that we're both suffering from yeah. the conflict and we've both lost people. I think it's important to try to understand what are the conditions that drive us into conflict with one another and who benefits. Because at the end of the day, I do believe that there are people who benefit from our conflict. And unless we're exactly. able to identify that and break free of that, we're not going to be able to end the cycle of violence. Yeah. So we both are victims. So let's stop just killing each other and let's start making ourselves not a victim anymore. Just living a true, real life with love. That's all. Yeah, I agree. My, uh, my cousin's godfather, who baptized my cousin, he was, uh, he was shot and killed. And I know him because he was always very friendly with our family. He was always very welcoming. He was always there around Christmas, so on, so on. And my uncle, my mother's brother, was shot in the leg. So it, was, it, was, it made me very angry, it made me very furious. But, you know, when I sat down and I thought, like, what, what's the purpose? What, what is the point to be so angry? Like, you know, they, as they say, life goes on. So what is the point of my getting revenge? It's just going to create more conflict. So, yes, it's painful. All of you have experienced that, so you know the feeling. I have the power to forgive because I have Israeli friends, I've met many Israeli people, I've hung out, I've had drinks, celebrated birthdays, um, you know, mutual friends, we've actually sat down, introduced me to an Israeli, no problem at all. See, we as a Palestinian, we only dream about a normal life. We don't want anything else. And that's what Israel can do because you have the power. You are the one who decide here, whatever will be in the future, you decide, not us. You know, and I know, and everybody knows that the decision is yours. So take your time, but take a good decision because we are talking about millions of people who are going to live just by your rules. And you can now, now stand up from Tel Aviv and go to, to take all the Middle East for you and all of it will become Israel. You can do it. I know Israel have the power. Israel have everything. And you are nice to us. Because you can't kill us in any moment, all of us, but you never did. 
But maybe it, if it was in a different situation and we have the power, maybe you would clean. Let's end this fight. That's all. I had a friend a few years back. He was uh, 19 years old, a Palestinian refugee, and uh, seemed like a happy uh, young adult. He was an actor in theater. Uh, he came from a fairly you know, middle-class, stable family. Um, yes, there's challenges living in a refugee camp, but his life on the surface didn't seem that terrible. And uh, one day he uh, crossed um, the wall into Jerusalem and uh, exploded a bus. And um, it, he died uh, in that occasion. And it just, uh, to me, it was obviously you know, painful to watch. Um, but it showed me how deep-rooted some of the traumas are, where uh, you may not even see it manifest on the surface. Um, someone who seemed like such a normal 19-year-old kid, having fun, joking around, working, playing, uh, could so easily be motivated to do that. And uh, it, it helped me to reflect on how deep and um, um, integrated our, our traumas might be in our lives and our identity here. Both peoples have experienced a lot of pain due to this conflict, but in order to move forward, we cannot let our suffering hold us hostage. So like we've discussed before, I think a lot of us have experienced suffering in different ways. And I think uh, it's never a competition, at least for me, as to who suffers more. For me, it's more so what is the current situation? who is suffering and how, and how can we end that and change that in order for both to move forward. Because a lot of people on the Israeli side don't know about Palestinian suffering and don't care about it in order for them to move forward. And a lot of Palestinians don't know about Israeli suffering and don't care about it in order for them to move forward. And the question is based on, do both sufferings have to be taken equally into consideration in order for us to move forward? Not about which one is worse, which one started first, which one is more responsible, but do both need to be solved equally in order to move forward. For me, I am willing to compromise. Yes, I know people on a personal level. My uncle, which is my mother's brother, was shot in the leg. He's fine today. He's able to come and go. You know, I know friends who have family relatives who were killed and so on and so on. So this is tragic for me, as you have also experienced the same, which is also tragic for you. But can you and I compromise this? In what way? I think that we can move forward. I think that there are, pro in my experience, I, I'm only meeting you today. In my experience, engaging with other Palestinians who have other stories and, you know, and yeah. experiences, etc., uh, I found that really what's most important to me and what's most important to them aren't in conflict mm -hmm. and that we can move forward. And there are certain things I imagine I and everyone here would be willing to compromise and certain things we wouldn't be willing to compromise. I'm concerned that without qualifying the statement and being very specific, very specific and very clear about what I'm willing to compromise, then it can be very easily misunderstood and counterproductive. Yeah, yeah. So related to this question you know, about the past and the suffering, for me, I'm willing to compromise. I'm willing to move forward for a better future. So, you know, being that my cousin's godfather was killed, life goes on. It's not the end of the world. You know, people die of cancer, people die of flu, people die. You know, so, so you're willing to compromise on revenge? I'm willing to compromise okay. on revenge. This is really important. The suffering is what people are holding revenge for. And this is what many, pe think, like, many people are not willing to forget, mm -hmm. especially for someone who lost their mother or their father or their brother or their sister. But like I said, you have to let go of some things to build a better future. I agree with you. Um, I think uh, in this conflict and generally in human nature, uh, very often suffering is used as currency or leverage in a conflict. And especially um, given the unique circumstances of both belligerents in this conflict here, uh, the Israelis and Palestinians, suffering is at the core of our identity. I could say, as someone who's Jewish, that uh, suffering is one of the fundamental building blocks of how our identity not necessarily was originally designed, but has emerged. Uh, suffering is a tremendous unifying factor. Um, it, it informs the way that we respond to the world, the way that we see threats, the way we've organized society in Israel. When suffering is a currency, it has value in your leverage and your position, in the rightness of your position, and in the 
rightness of the nature of your identity, it's very hard to give up on. But we take responsibility to create who it is we want to be in the world. That process is the process of peace. I only think that the problem started with us when we were children. Because I remember myself as a kid, and my mom wanted me to sleep, so she only told me, if you will not sleep now, there's a Jew who is coming to kill you. So I go to sleep directly. See, so the problem is as we are children, we are afraid of each other. So what's about now? Let's learn how to love each other. And that's what end. Or at least how to understand each other. Exactly. And, and engage the identity that the other experiences himself as. Why when I dream about, dream about a Jew, I think, oh, that's a nightmare. Why? Why? We have to learn how to love each other. I dreamed about a Jew. Okay, maybe he will be a friend one day. For me, the point is that we, we arise as, as children hitting each other and looking at each other. I'm better than this guy. He's better than me. I'm Muslim. I'm special. I'm Jew. I'm special. We are not the same. I'm better. He's better. That's the problem. The problem that we are looking at each other at objects. So as a Jew that grew up most of my life in the diaspora and moving all yeah. around the world, I was never taught to hate Arabs or Palestinians but I also never heard about their struggle, their narrative, their identity, or anything about them. So going into the army, ironically enough, was the first time I actually was able to engage in Palestinians and actually see them as real human beings in front of me. Now, of course, the power dynamic wasn't ideal to create conversation and to truly understand, but through that experience, it started to open my mind. There is another population that exists here, and although I've experienced them sometimes as the enemy, I've never been taught that they were the enemy, that they were fundamentally bad. And the only way for us to move forward is not to focus on our governments telling us what to do, but from the population, from the ground up, to be able to build relations together and have a vision of what type of future we'd like to create. For 19 years of my age, I never met a citizen, Israeli citizens. I always meet just army, military, Israeli people. That's the problem. We should connect to each other more. I'm a geopolitical tour guide. I do dual narrative tours, Israelis, Palestinians, different perspectives. And I believe in truth. I'm not saying absolute, but I believe in facts. I mean, how do we know what we know, which is the study of epistemology and philosophy? How do we know what we, how do we make sure what we know is fact? And the second is to realize that we both have different perspectives of history. So you just mentioned, for example, we were attacked, we had to defend ourselves. For us, this is a myth. We even laugh. Because in 1947, over 300,000 Palestinians were already kicked out before any war erupted, including my own family. We need to realize we have different perspectives of history. And, and that's where uh, it's not really defense to us. Our experience is that in 1920, your people massacred us. In 1929, your people massacred us. In the late 1930s, your people were massacring us. And it was, and within our community, at that time, there were many internal debates. Do we fight back? Do we not fight back? Do we rely on the British to keep order? Do we only fight back when we're attacked? Or do we initiate attacks on the communities that attacked us? These were very deep, very divisive debates within the Jewish community here. You know, you said before that the Europeans, especially the British, were favoring us. It's interesting, when we learn the history, and we learn about the 1920s and 30s and 40s, we're learning that the British were pro-Arab. And you're learning that they were pro-Zionist. You know what they really were? They were pro-British. And sometimes they would say things that sounded pro-Israel, just like the Americans today. And sometimes they'd say things that sound pro-Palestinian because they were advancing their own interests and they were forcing us into conflict with one another because that's what the British do. That's what imperialists do. They divide and rule native populations. And we fell for it. Zionism from the left to the right did not uh, uh, formulate any solution or even have a meaningful conversation about what would be with the non-Jews in our land. And I think that's one of the most important conversations that Israeli society needs to have right now. But I'll also say that there was a group that might not be considered Zionist, depends who you ask, uh, the Lehi, the Lochmei Herut Israel, the Fighters for the Freedom of Israel, or the Stern Gang, that actually did formulate a position that did include a, a certain amount of Palestinians in their ranks, 
They were one of the, their political party in 1948 was one of the only political parties that included both Jews and Palestinians on their list to Knesset. And they did have an ideology of Semitic unity and they did have an ideology of inclusion and an ideology of fighting the British together, not just Jews and Palestinians, but also Egyptians and also Kurds and everybody in the region. And in 1948, before the war happened, they put out leaflets. I have copies I can show you in Arabic saying, to the Arabic-speaking peoples of Palestine, do not let the British manipulate you into fighting us. For years we've been fighting against them, we don't see you as our enemy, but if you allow them to manipulate you into fighting us, we will fight you like we fought them. And that's exactly what happened. Regarding the context, uh, Palestinians are in a different need for a liberation. We, are, we need a liberation because we're the victims, we're the main oppressed, and so we need a liberation from an occupation, from a regime, from uh, our whole historic uh, right to come back here, which is very different today for the Jewish person who lives here. At this point, Israeli society sees Palestinians as part of a broader Arab collective that has tried countless times to wipe us out. And we think, we really think, I know this is going to shock you, we really think we are the weaker party in the conflict. And that if we aren't able to maintain control and a military edge and even allow ourselves to be subordinate to the interests of foreign empires in the region, then we can't survive. Our liberation is not just a nice thing, yes, I want to stop raping you and therefore you need to be sensitive to my suffering. I'm saying that the suffering you're experiencing is connected to my oppression. And there's no such thing as liberation for you without liberation for me. And there's no such thing as liberation for me without liberation for you. They're intertwined. We can't get away from it. I don't want to compete with you. I don't want to tell, I don't want to show you my suffering and, and look to see yours. I want to end it. I want to move forward. And the only way to do it is to be able to really understand the, uh, the actual material conditions forcing us into the situation. The involvement of foreign powers like Europe and the United States has done more harm than good. Well, you were most enthusiastic, so, so you should start. Until today, we have the American uh, intervention. We have, uh, we had before the British as well as European in general. So we see it as a, a huge negative influence from a Palestinian perspective. It was totally biased towards the Jews. Until today, we see the Americans in particular biased towards Israel, and so that doesn't help whatsoever. And it just serves, or it serves mainly not only maybe their interests uh, in the region. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think that uh, a lot of things exist today that cause both the Palestinians and Israelis not to be able to have conversations with each other, not to be able to see the suffering and the aspirations of each other, and a lot of those reasons is because of foreign powers. So for example, something that I'm very openly critici criticizing all the time is the US foreign aid that is given from the US to Israel. Now, why am I against that? Because in theory, I want Israel to be supported in any way from whoever. But it also comes with a cost. It means that 90% of that money or more, a little bit less, plus minus 90% of that money is not actual money. It's credit that Israel has to use by buying weapons from the US. And what does that cause? You think that the US wants to give us weapons for free? It causes us to be dependent on the US and allows the US to dictate certain elements of what Israel is allowed or not allowed to do. And because of that, because I believe fully in that the people living on this land should have the rights to themselves and not be controlled by other nations or other empires, we need to be the ones that take our control back and be against these individuals or these powers that force us to be separate. It's 100% now, but the, the truth is anyone who understands, if any, any Israeli who understands how foreign aid actually works as a tool of empire would be against taking aid. And yes, the weapons don't just come to Israel, the weapons are going to the Palestinian Authority, it's going to Egypt, it's going to uh, Jordan, it's going to Saudi Arabia, and to Bahrain, and to all other people, meaning the parties that we trust to broker peace are the same parties who make the most money from our conflicts. That should be understood. And the foreign aid, like you said, the military aid is really just corporate welfare. It's an American government subsidy to its own arms industry. At the end of the day, that's what it is. But this idea that the British and then the Americans up till now have been pro-Israel is exactly how what they're doing works. Meaning when I hear you say that, 
I see you as a victim of their propaganda and their tools because really they're not pro me and they're not pro you. They are pro their agenda and their agenda involves you hating me and me hating you and us fighting with one another and buying their weapons. So if we can acknowledge that they have their own agendas which are not a Zionist agenda or an Israeli agenda or a Palestinian agenda or a Muslim agenda, it's their agenda and that we're all being victims of the agenda and part of us breaking free from that victimhood is acknowledging what they're doing and how they're doing it. At the end of the day, the nature of geopolitics in the world is, is that smaller states, and we're both smaller nations, exist in a hierarchy that's organized by greater powers. That is the law of the jungle. It's the way that life works. There is no existence in a vacuum whatsoever. The foreign powers have made tremendous mistakes. They absolutely play for their interests, and they have played an extremely important role that's sometimes unseen or not experienced directly in dividing and, and keeping the peace at times, if not for which there would be far greater bloodshed and much, much bigger problems than we have today. And we need to be grateful for that, I think. It's a crucial location. It's not in Israel's interest or the Palestinians' interest. It's in America's interest to have full control. Just like Iran has, you know, the relationship with Hezbollah. It's not in Hezbollah's interest, it's in Iran's interest. So this is a crucial location for military bases, for trade. You know, so it's not in our interest or your interest. We are the ones that are losing here while they are benefiting. I support the two-state solution. I support the two-state solution as well as one-state solution. But I think a two-state solution can be temporarily amazing if it can uh, bring, like, imminent peace now. Like, the fastest way of bringing at least peace, relationships, and sovereignty for us Palestinians over our own uh, people, our own land, our own future. And then maybe if we live together as two states in peace, maybe we can create a united nations of Israel and Palestine in the future. We can't build a bridge between Palestine and Israel and there is a wall between us. We can't. First remove the wall, then think about one country solution. But while the wall is existed, there is no one state solution. That's the real, that's the fact for me. So I'm completely against the wall that it exists. I think it forces both populations to experience each other as uh, either an enemy or a foreigner. And they never actually are able to experience one another, which causes a lot of us to be raised with either misconceptions or even sometimes hatred. So I'm against the wall. The reason I'm against a two states is because I always focus on two things when it comes to both people fulfilling the aspirations and solving the injustices. I don't think that a two-state solution fulfills the aspirations for both, definitely not for Jews, and also for Palestinians who want access to movement and being able to visit uh, their cousins and their family in Akko and in Yafo, and for Jews to be able to live in Shechem and Bethlehem and in Chevron in places that are fundamental for us, the central homeland of, of where we believe is our homeland, then there are other elements there are 600 to 700,000 Jews living in Judea and Samaria, the West Bank today. The reality is that they were not going to be removed. And also there are security issues that exist for Israel. There are so many issues that don't actually help us solve the problems that we experience because we just continue to be two states now enemies in the state format and doesn't allow us to fulfill the aspirations. And for that reason, I'm against a two-state solution. I actually think that the, the two-state solution comes from abroad, it doesn't even come from the people on the land. And what's most important for you, both of you, and correct me if I'm wrong, is solving the situation that exists for the Palestinians today, ending that suffering, and being able to achieve a better life to live together on this land as an equal and prideful individual giving back the, the humanity, giving back the, the pride, no more humiliation, giving back the identity, living free and feeling like whatever the name of the country that you exist in, I feel proud to be here. And I feel that this country is protecting me and representing me. And I think that can exist with creating not necessarily one or two state, right? It's not black and white, but creating a civilization that is more native to how we live 
that includes all of us living in it and allows Jews to experience this as the reestablishment of their civilization and allows the Palestinians to experience this creation as their homeland as well and a place that they can be equal within. And that is something that I support. And I don't think it's necessarily by imposing one state, two state, three state solutions now. I think we need to start having conversations amongst ourselves to figure out what do we need to start building and what do we need to start changing. And I think only there, with that route can we actually get to somewhere. From what I understand, what both of you expressed is that it's not that the two-state solution is an ideal. It's what you think is most possible right now. Because there is a wall okay. between well, two places. Let's, let's take down the wall. Then you can do a one country. Okay, thank you. thank you. Problem solved. I'll tell you that right now the truth is I believe a two-state solution is impossible. I think a one-state solution is impossible. I think the status quo is impossible. I think that there is no solution that is possible until we fix the relationships between us. I think if we want to find solutions that could work, first we have to improve the relationship dynamics and get to know each other and not be afraid of each other's stories. And a lot of what I experience from you is fear of our story. Like I, like I, when I, and it's not only you, I think on our side we have a lot. From what I've heard, What's important to you is to live in a democratic society where you have full equality. What's important to us is to feel the correction of what the Romans did to us, that are where we've rebuilt our civilization. We, we have to think about what we can do. And what we can do right now is not to make this solution or that solution. And the two-state solution is, of course, the solution of the West. It's not our solution. Yeah. Just like the British and French drew lines all over the map and created artificial states based on artificial identities without taking into consideration the uh, alliance, the, the cultures, the values, the allegiances, the tribal associations of any of the people that they were making states for. That's the two-state solution also. But we are already separate about each other. So, well, let's not be separate, because we have to, let, let's not be separate. He's saying that this is the solution, so we are not separate. Right. Yeah, the the two-state solution keeps us separate. The yeah, two-state solution in, reinforces the separateness, and it doesn't just separate me from you. It separates me from Hebron. It separates yeah. me from, from Bet El. It separates me from Shiloh, and it separates you from Yafo, and it separates you from Tzvat, and it separates you from Beersheva. And I'm saying that you can't be separated from those places, and you can't be separate from me. If Israel agrees to do it, I think it can be a fast relief <gasps> from the conflict and then hopefully if we live together. So that's how we stop anybody who's abusing no, we, in our we, lives. We are determined to we, resist a two-state solution. Sure, sure. But I'm saying... No, not stop. sure, sure. We are, <laughs> we are determined to resist a two-state solution. Are you determined? Sure, sure. I am determined to resist I'm a two-state solution. And you have to understand, we don't relate to this land as real estate. This isn't, this isn't like territory, you called it a material thing. This land is our soulmate and we're not willing to divide it, but I do want to include you in our society in a, in a way that's dignified and in a way that's equal and in a way that allows us to move forward together. You try to talk to me about dividing a land, that's going to be a fight. And any of our leaders who've agreed to or offered a two-state solution in the past were acting in the, against the interests of our people and betraying our history. But, but you're saying it from a place of not exclusive, not excluding, not which is beautiful. So I, I just hope this, please. You know, the, the thing is, is that you have so many Israeli Arabs. What, what, if, if there was a two-state solution, Israel, where are you going to go with all these Arabs? You're just going to kick them out and send them here to us? I'm, I'm not for this. a two-state solution. Yeah, I'm, I'm saying, I'm, I'm saying, I'm, in I'm talking in, in general. Clear. You're talking about over half a million people. Where are you going to go with these people? We are too integrated. We were always integrated. Arabs and Jews have always lived together. It is possible and it's the best solution. But like he said, with dignity and it should be equal. The communities we come from criticize us for normalizing relations with the other. <laughs> I think this is uh, one of the big similarities that we have, not only because we've experienced each other differently, because a lot of the times when we start opening our hearts, I think everyone here has a very big heart and has first an interest of being able to move forward. And when we try to focus on building that, a lot of people that have experienced so much trauma or are living in a limited mindset of seeing the only way that I could succeed is by taking out another, basically a zero sum game. There's the only way I can go forward is by removing the other. It causes them that sees us willing to be open and having those conversations to have a negative attitude towards us. 
But I think a lot of them don't understand the nuance of what we're speaking here. We're not talking about giving up on our aspirations. We're not talking about giving up on the needs to end the injustices that we experience. We're talking about that as well, but we don't see it happening at the cost of the other. Because the way we see it is that we don't see a future where Palestinians disappear, and we don't see a future where Israelis disappear. So if we're both going to live here, we have to be able to create a reality that exists both of us at once. Let's say my mom is hurt by somebody who really offended her. How likely is she to be offended more if I go and engage with that person without respecting that he offended her? So it's very deeply disrespectful to my mom to offend with the same person who keeps offending her. I should defend her rather than engage with her. So that's where normalization comes from. It's a psychology of hurt. Now, I'm not saying it's only that. Normalization, it's rooted definitions according to many of our uh, movements, Palestinian movements. It's compromising injustice. And so normalization comes there. But I don't believe in normalization, meaning in cutting off relationships that can be healthy for my own people. We have to accept each other. Regardless, someone hurt his mother, I have to accept that. My mother has to accept that. And I have to look forward. I think like what Malcolm said uh, about the same analogy works for us, that somebody hurt our mother and then we're going and talking to them. I think there are a lot of people on our side who have a lot of pain and a lot of anger. This and, is and where anger. compromising comes in. Okay. In the Jewish world in general or even the specific communities that I've lived in, I think that what's important for them to understand, and I think it's an, an, a mentality switch that needs to take place on the Israeli side, is that by me engaging with Palestinians and by me trying to imagine and work towards a just solution in this land that's inclusive of both peoples, it's not me retreating from Jewish liberation, it's me trying to advance Jewish liberation. And when I talk to you, I'm speaking to you as an advancement of Jewish liberation, not as a retreat from it, not as a compromise on it. I'm not compromising. I believe that this is one of the objectives of Jewish history in the post-Zionist world, and that means I need to engage you, and I, everybody can do their own cheshbonot, everybody can do their own uh, formulation of uh, analysis, but the conclusion I've come to is that one of the major goals of Jewish liberation now is peace with you. Just like the same as reviving the Hebrew language and fighting the British to free our land. And by the way, you should know that according to official British documents, they left this country because of Jewish terrorism. That doesn't exactly fit in with your narrative of us being a proxy of theirs 100%. I believe justice can be achieved in our lifetime. It's easy, remove the wall no, and talk to each other. It, it requires us, we absolutely, I believe, peace and justice can be achieved in our lifetimes, but we have to change the way we think. You're, you're compromising this, this pain that you have, this, this uh, hate, this, this um, revenge feeling, this grudge. You have to compromise that. You have to, you have to, be able to not forget. They talk about compromising on the rejection of the other. Yes. Yeah. That we yes. have to remove. Exactly. Yeah. This. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. And we have to make space for the other in our own story so we can be partners. And it, but it's a mentality switch. And I know it's a mentality switch that's really, really, really difficult for most Palestinians and for most Israelis. We need to understand that justice is a process. Mm -hmm. I mean, since the dawn of humanity until today, are we really achieving justice in our lifetime? Justice is a process. I'm a dreamer of justice and peace. Peace is the found, uh, or justice is the foundation of peace. Peace is the expression of justice. Without justice, there is no peace. Justice, for, for my understanding, is a solution here, whatever that solution is, a solution, a reality here, that we both experience as victory in our subjective narratives. One solution that according to the story I'm living in and according to the story you're living in, we both experience as a happy ending. To put it back in, back, back in context, justice to the victims is very different from justice for the oppressors. And in our context, being Palestinians, the mainly their victims, justice means back uh, our rights, our dignity, apologies, uh, admission or admitting that there has been massacres against us, expulsion, etc., taking of our villages. So our justice sounds different, but the biggest justice... It actually sounds very similar because we see the world that way as well, right? We see it as the surrounding Arab nations tried to attack us and we've been suffering for so long 
And because of that suffering, a reality exists today where we had to become strong, where we would have been killed, all of us. And because of these conflicts, now there are people suffering. So the reality exists is we both think we're the oppressed. And we have to remove that oppression. Now, it's not, it's not, a, it's sure, not a... But we have reality versus what we think. Right, right. It's, and, it's not a competition about who's suffering more. We both experience both of our stories as the oppressed. And I will never change my mind that I'm the oppressed. And the only way to move forward that is by figuring out what do I need in order to not feel oppressed anymore and what do you need not to feel oppressed anymore. Right. You're, you're addressing the solution as well. But for us to reach to the solution, we need to understand the problem. We need to understand that we both have those two different narratives. Yes. And we need to understand, yes, how to tolerate that we do have different narratives. But we need all of us, including me and my first, uh, I'm the first one, to, to be really authentic about looking for the facts and then evaluating reality. So, for example, I would highly disagree with the term of we've been suffering for the last 100 years as Jews. That's not for us, that's a myth. For the last 71 years, Jews have been the how would you feel? How would you feel if I told you that your group? suffering is a myth? No, but, but wait a second. I'm not trying to be offensive. I'm trying to be factual. But, but it is offensive because for us, it's a reality that we've suffered. Sure, but we've been 71 years. We're suffering by you. You're our army. You're our occup occupier. You're taking our well, land. You're, you're talking us, about you're 67. That. Before 67... 71 uh, years. 1948 until today. But in 1948 till 67, the West Bank, Judea, and Samaria, and Gaza was not under Israel. Yeah, but so there's a lot of... There's a lot of was also suffering to There's us. a lot of nuance. They, they consider 48 suffering also. But right. It's the biggest suffering. 48 is suffering. But we also experienced suffering before that and we experienced suffering after that. And we believe... Sure, but the suffering after came as a result of what you, what you started, in our opinion. I mean, right. I know it's different. Right. But to say that we both are suffering 100 years, I think it's inaccurate historically and it puts us in equilibrium, which I don't think is fair. Because we are the victim is way... There's no comparison between the oppressor. And his whole main of his main suffering is coming from this guy. Your main no. suffering is, is coming from your inability to transcend the generic narrative. That's where your main suffering is from. You're suffering from an inability to transcend a generic narrative. Because really, to, to move forward, we need to be like This is your opinion. Yeah, it is my that's my opinion. I'm only my opinion. I don't see it this way. Let him say something. He wants to say it this way, but this is your opinion. Please, please. So you, you have to accept that they suffered. You can't just say, no, we are the only ones that suffered because they have a story just like we have a story. Yes, maybe we were oppressed more by the state of Israel, but they also suffered. So it's not about, oh, we suffered more. Oh, no, you suffered more. No, my, uh, it's not like that. We have to accept each other's story, agree on something that, you know, that includes your interest and their interest, and we move forward. So we have to accept there's two sides to a story. Always.